This is Pro Blogger. My name's Darren Rouse and I'm the blogger behind problogger.com, a blog, podcast, event, job board, and a series of ebooks designed to help you as a blogger to grow your blog, to increase your audience, to write amazing content, and to build some profit around your blog. You can learn more about ProBlogger and all that we do to help you as a blogger over at problogger.com. Now, today's episode is number 202, and in it, I have my good friend and co-author of the Pro Blogger book, Chris Garrett, on the show to talk about the changes in blogging since we wrote the Pro Blogger book. And Chris and I first wrote that book, the first edition of that book, in 2008, so coming up on a 10-year anniversary. Now, it's gone through a few different versions. Our third edition is currently out, but that was published in 2012, so it's been five years since we wrote the last edition of the book. And so I thought it might be interesting to get Chris on to talk about, amongst other things, how we would update that book if we were to do another version. Not that we're planning on doing that. Uh, The book, I think, still holds up pretty well at its core, but there are some things that have obviously come about in the last five years that we would add to that. And so if you've read that book in the past or if you want to read it, um, This is a good companion episode, I guess, for that. We cover a lot of other ground as well. Chris tells his story of starting blogging uh, in 1996. Not that it was called blogging back then, but essentially that's what he was doing. And he also talks about how effectively he monetized that blogging through what we would now call content marketing, uh, years before that term was invented. We also talk about the main reasons that we see bloggers starting to blog, um, either because they want to express themselves very organically, as Chris and myself did, or because they want to make money. And we try and work out which is the best um, uh, alternative. We talk about the challenges um, facing bloggers today. We talk about staying motivated over the long haul with your blogging. And we talk about the balance of getting great content out for your blog, whilst you're also trying to do all those other things like trying to create a product to sell. We cover a lot of ground in this particular episode, so I do recommend you grab a cup of coffee coffee or your favorite beverage and settle in for a conversation. Chris has uh, started a blog called Maker Hacks, which we do talk about here as well. And he's also works at Copy Blogger, um, the company behind Copy Blogger, the blog, but also Studio Press. Um, and so we talk a little bit about that as well. You can find all uh, the transcript of today's show as well as a lot of links, uh, which we will mention along the way over on our show notes. Our show notes are at problogger.com forward slash podcast forward slash 202. And there's also some links there to our Facebook group, which is Chris is a very active member of. Um, there's links there to our events that are coming up, our Aussie events in the next two weeks. There's still a handful of tickets for those and our Dallas event later in the year. Links to um, Studio Press and uh, Chris's other blog as well as well as a link to our book, uh, which you can find on Amazon, and you can pick it up pretty cheap, uh, used uh, a used copy of that as well. So head over to the show notes as you listen at problogger.com forward slash podcast forward slash 202. Okay, let's get into today's conversation. Creating great content, finding an audience, building engagement, monetizing your blog. This is Pro Blogger. Hey Chris, how are you? I'm good. Um, it's been a while since we've done one of these. So it's uh, nice to hear your voice. That, I know. Uh, Aussie well, accent. <laughs> yes, well, I'm, I, you've got that Canadian accent now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think anybody would ever think that. <laughs> no, no. How long have you been in Canada now? Yeah, we moved here 2010. I mean, I was born here. But, uh, yeah. You can't tell from my accent, can you? No. I'm trying. <laughs> You'll get there. You'll get there. You just got to put a couple of eh, A's. Is it A's? Or <laughs> is that how they end sentences up there? A, a? yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Boot, apparently. <laughs> well, it was funny. Uh, the other day I was um, I came across your um, some of your comments in the group and I was like, oh, we haven't chatted for a long time. And then I I, um, I guess I went my mind went back and I started to think about how long has it been since we chatted, but also how long since we wrote 
the Pro Blogger book, and many of the listeners of our um, podcast probably don't even know that I wrote a book because it was back in 2008 <laughs> that we we wrote the first version of the Pro Blogger book, and then it was updated in 2010, I think, as the second edition, and then 2012, and that was all with Wiley. Um, so it's been five years since that last version was written and in internet time, that's like 50 years. <laughs> so I thought it might be good to jump back on today and chat a little bit about the current state of blog and blogging because things have changed a lot. Um, and also maybe we could do some hypothetical stuff, what we would include in the new pro blogger book if there was to be one. Not that I think there will. <laughs> but before we kind of get into that, maybe just for those um, listeners who don't know you, um, they've probably seen you interacting in our Facebook group, but um, could you just give us a little bit of the story of, you know, how did you get back into blogging in days gone by? Well, I, I started out with the bulletin boards. and So I started out online before the web really was in anybody's public consciousness. But uh, I worked for a college straight out of school. I left school when I was 15, which, you know, for everybody who was listening with kids, it's, I'm not, I don't recommend leaving school when you're 15. It worked for me. Um, but my, my first proper full-time career job was uh, working for a college. I worked for a hospital before then. And obviously, it being an education institution, we got onto the internet pretty early. And it was my job to set us up on the internet as an ISP, so like the local libraries, local school teachers could get connected. So I had to get us this super fast broadband two megabit connection, <laughs> and uh, and everybody could dial into us. And uh, basically, all my colleagues took one step backwards. So I was volunteered, volunteered to do it. But it was brilliant, and I, I loved it. And so I geeked out. So I was teaching HTML, and I'd, everybody had a personal website back then you know you, you got a dial-up account and some space and and then later things like geocities came along but everybody had like a personal website but then around 1996 i really got into the online user groups and email discussion lists so like, i'm complete 100 percent nerd mm, so i are. created a, <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> I'm, I'm quite proud of that uh, so i created a, a site around doctor who and red dwarf and all of this it was like an online fanzine and I'd say that was my first blog because it was reverse chronological and it had comments. It had a guest book. Uh, and that was 1996. So, um, and at the same time, I was on like every programming discussion list I could find because, you know, getting answers for computer programming questions um, wasn't easy. And I would pay back. So I would answer everybody else's. And that's how I started writing articles. If I repeated myself too often, I would say, here's the article, ask me any questions you'd like. And suddenly people started following me and really enjoying my articles and emailing me for, with questions. I started getting a little bit of a profile accidentally. But the really weird thing is, um, and this is how my monetization started, first I was invited to a site that did a share of advertising revenue, which I never anticipated steve smith he was called really cool guy but then people started emailing me saying i want you to train our guys and i was like but i've given you all this free info is it incomplete you know other questions and they're like no it shows that you know what you're talking about we'll fly you or you know we'll give you uh, accommodation and we'll pay you whatever it takes teach our guys this stuff and i was weirded out because i didn't have a sales page you know i would, I didn't set myself up as that. And then I was getting these freelance um, writing opportunities, writing for print magazines. And it, it just, you know, it, all I'd done was answer some questions on the internet. <laughs> and you know me, I, I'm not the most confident or outgoing guy. If I'd have set out to do that, well, I wouldn't have set out to do that. That's just not in my personality. So it, it kind of landed in my lap in a way. Uh, and then I got uh, an internet consulting job, a full-time job at an internet consultancy, and then moved from that into the advertising and marketing space, and then left in 2005 to join Performance In, which was a startup that burnt very hot very quickly. Yeah, it did. <laughs> yeah, uh, that, that's how I met you and Brian, obviously, so yeah. it was all 
it was a, it was around that time we started to I guess come into contact and um, I'd been approached to write this book by Wiley and I I thought that was a joke when I first got the email from Wiley saying do you want to do you want to write a book and I'm like no it's one of my friends joking who would want me to write a book and then um then that it dawned on me that it was true um and I suddenly started to freak out because a book was so much bigger than anything I'd written before I'd written a lot of blog posts but I'd never written a book and so that's when I freaked out and thought okay I need to find someone to write the other half <laughs> and and that's where we began to talk. And, um, you know, one of the things I, I'm always amazed about by writing that book um, was that we had not actually even spoken on Skype or on the phone or voice to voice until I think probably we were writing the last chapter or two. And we, we were, I, I do remember that we did get on Skype at one stage. And I, I was, um, it was kind of a surreal experience to write something so. Um, quite such a big project together um, and not even really know each other having never met yeah yeah we only met after the book came along which is like just blows people's minds because it's like how did you collaborate well the internet (laughs) yes and we've got a few photos together um, although most of them there's a um a woman between us, which is quite yeah. strange. I searched um, Google Images the other day and there's all these photos of people wanting a photo of the two of us, but we never really took one in the early days of the two of us. So, um, yeah. But anyway, so the, the Prologue book kind of, kind of came along around that time. Um, maybe just give us a quick um, feeling of what's happened since the Prologue book for you because um, Performance Inc. was um, a company that you were involved with, but you are now, um, you've moved on into other ventures as well. Yeah, well, Performance Inc. lasted like... I don't know, two years or something. And it, 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 as I said, it burned very brightly, but it didn't have a long life. <laughs> and um, I mean, at the time, it was a really good idea. It was education, software, community. Funnily enough, the company I work for now does education, software, community. Um, but in between, I was an internet consultant. I, I left that when it imploded and, you know, I didn't really want to go straight back into another startup or anything. So I've since advised startups, and you could call the company I work for now almost as an old startup. But uh, yeah, now I, I work for Copyblogger. I work for Rainmaker Digital as the parent company currently because we've got some things going on. Um, and I'm the chief digital officer, which is perfect for me because it's a combination of technology and marketing so i i get to nerd out about content and marketing but also you know the the technical side and the under the hood stuff so it's awesome yeah and it's an amazing company really you know, a lot of people from days gone by will remember copy blogger starting um just after pro blogger started and we were kind of almost like brother sister blogs or brother brother blogs um and uh you know copy blogger brian clark really focused on copy and and writing um but since then it's uh, just grown into so much more than that you can um you get your wordpress themes there with studio press and the genesis themes and um so much more we, we might sort of tap into some of that towards the end of the podcast as well but you also have a, your own blog um maker hacks yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um it's funny because uh, I had a photography blog uh, around the time that digital photography school was started, and I sold it. <laughs> and at the time, I thought, oh, I got quite a nice <laughs> amount of money for that. Um, but it, it was like a millionth of the size of digital photography school. It wasn't even on the same planet. Uh, but I've always nerded out about things, as we mentioned before. And my business blog, I, I keep it alive, but it's not really... You know, it's not a passion for me anymore, but I like 3D printing and electronics and building things and, you know, in in, in the trade, they call it STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering and math. But I just like geeking out about electronics and Raspberry Pi and Arduino and 3D printing, laser cutting and all these things. So that's my passion project and it's doing quite well even though I, I neglect it almost as much as my main blog you're listening to pro blogger one of the things i really do want to tap into is um 
the changes that are going on in the blogosphere um, because you know you started in 1996 um, when it wasn't even a a blogging wasn't really even a word I don't know when that first started to be used but I I started in 2002 um, so quite late by comparison Um, but so much has changed since those times Um, we both got into it fairly uh, intuitively, fairly organically, because we wanted to either play with the technology or we wanted to express ourselves and we wanted to connect with other people. And it strikes me that one of the big changes today is that bloggers often get into blogging with a completely different intent. Um, they they start today, many, not all, but many start because they want to make money or they want to build a profile or they want to become an influencer. Do you have an opinion about which is the better pathway? Because some some bloggers still do get into it very organically, um, and there's probably some advantages of that, but um, it probably takes a bit longer as well. Do you have any thoughts on the best pathway there? Yeah, I think the worst is when you start a blog about making money online Mm. and you haven't made any money online. (laughs) And it's like, I can understand people wanting to do that, and I can understand people wanting to blog about what they're learning about. So... I'm okay when people say, I'm learning about this, come along with me. That's what I did with photography. That's what I'm doing with maker hacks. I'm okay with that. It's when people try to position themselves as an expert before they make one cent. That's a little bit dodgy to me. But can you remember back when when we were starting to build a profile and when copy bloggers started? I mean, Brian especially was out on the in the trenches being shot at by people who were like, how dare you monetize? And now it's like people are, I'm going to start a blog because I want to make money. And I think that's great in some ways. But during the promotion of our book, there was, I can't remember what the film was, but it was about somebody who started a, a cooking blog. And that really spiked our sales. And I think that was a turning point when people realized that this was a thing, you know, that you could create a website and make money in your spare time. And that it was possible because there was some cynicism when we were starting to talk about monetization as if it was not a real thing. And one of our friends even got stopped at the border because he said his career was blogging. <laughs> yes, that's right. It, um, there was, I think there was, I mean, some people said, no, you can't do it. It's impossible and they're lying. Um, some people said, oh, you have to be a dodgy kind of internet marketer to do it. Uh, so you can't do it ethically. Uh, and then others were like, oh, he's, they're just lucky. Um, and that were kind of the, the three big objections that I heard a lot of in yeah. those days. Yeah. Yeah. I could definitely have understood um, anybody being cynical about it. And I think it's a healthy attitude. I mean, all through the book, we say it's hard work. It's not going to happen straight away. It's not going to happen for everybody. But if if I hadn't had people contact me wanting to send me money, yeah. I wouldn't have believed it either. Yeah. Yeah, and it was a surprise to to all of us. I think, you know, you were surprised people wanted to fly you around. I was surprised when we were approached to write a book, and um, you know, when I made seven dollars on my first day from AdSense um, yeah. before when, I realized when you were getting cameras to review because yeah. you had a photography site before digital photography school. That's right, and I think um, I guess the advantage for us is that we weren't trying to market from the start, and so it came across as very generous, very natural perhaps um and maybe that is one of the advantages of starting without the intent of marketing Um, i did have some pushback though when i first created a digital product or mentioned selling any services i did have some people saying you've sold out and it it doesn't matter how many people you say you know i do have to pay a mortgage (laughs) there are but what I realized in recent years is they were never going to buy, let them go, let them unsubscribe, call your names. There's always somebody else to talk to that is a better fit. But at the time it hurt, it stung, you know, any criticism. Um, back when I was doing the computer programming list, uh, one guy who's actually a friend now um, <sighs> told me a new one <laughs> in email uh, about something I'd written, and it really – hit me and um, my wife Claire had to talk me down and say don't give up you know this is just one guy's opinion he might be famous in the the community but it's one guy's opinion you know stick with it and fortunately I didn't leave and decide to do something else but that criticism I think if anything is worse 
today in terms of volume, but I think more understanding is available today. Uh, you know, we all know what a troll is, whereas back then I, I think it was all a bit fresh and a bit raw or a bit new. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember being stopped in my tracks numerous times by trolls um, and it would take my attention away from the business for, for weeks, whereas now you get a troll comment and you're just like, troll, <laughs> move on. Yeah. Um, yeah, and maybe, that's, maybe it's because we've been at it longer and, and um, have thickened our skin, but maybe it's just, yeah, it's a different culture and people kind of almost expect that it's coming Um to, towards them. So one of the questions we got in the group was from uh, Jocelyn Kate, and I found it quite interesting. She said, what was the very beginning like? We've kind of touched on that, but she says, I feel like every blogger I hear kind of starts with their story on chapter three. So I want to know, did you work full time? Did you have parents who were entrepreneurs? Um, so it was just in your blood or did you, um, you know, work from being an everyday to a hugely successful blogger? How did you actually do that? Um, uh, so for you, was it in your blood? Um. <laughs> no. Uh, and uh, as I said before, I don't have the entrepreneurial personality even. I mean, I feel like I've got some of that now because uh, it's got sort of bubbled to the surface. But naturally, in my blood, I think um, the opposite of that, because my dad was a fireman and my mum cared for people with disabilities. So it's not like there's any I, I can't think of how I would have acquired that <laughs> genetically right yeah <laughs> uh, and then you know when you're nurtured in an environment of um you know my dad used to run into burning fires to save people and my mum used to care for people that couldn't care for themselves making money isn't really a conversation you have you know if anything uh, I was raised afraid of money because the only arguments my parents ever had were overpaying the bills so I don't have that you know that plenty mindset that uh, abundance mindset um so it it happened by accident for me but which is kind of cool because I can empathize with other people who aren't entrepreneurs whenever anybody says hustle I get like a cringe because that's not how it works for me yeah. at all yeah I think I'm, I'm similar in some ways my dad was a uh, a minister of a church. My mum was a, a nurse and then um, stayed at home for, you know, at most of our schooling um, to, to care for us and support, you know, dad in the work that he was doing as well. So it certainly wasn't, I wasn't taught to make money because there wasn't much going around in our house. Um, but I, I do think I had a kind of a creative spirit and a, um, an interesting communication from day one. And perhaps that was because I saw my dad getting up in front of people every week and, and um, speaking. So maybe that was there, but it didn't come naturally. And selling is probably the biggest thing that I've struggled with, um, trying to work out how to sell. And I, I kind of relate to what you said before. You didn't really feel comfortable with that um, in, in many regards, and that's something you need to learn to do. But I think being uncomfortable with it as well is an advantage because you – you see the objections that your readers might have as you're writing your sales copy. And so um, uh, that can be an advantage if it doesn't stop you in your tracks. Yeah. And I think the confidence thing did. Uh, I was going to burn out when I was doing my consulting and selling courses and digital products and all of that stuff. Um, we had the best financial year of all of the time I had my own business. And it, we'd just moved to Canada. Everything was going great. And I sat down with my wife and we were like, no, you're going to burn out, Chris, because every launch I did, I thought it was going to be the last and we wouldn't be able to pay the bills. And, you know, and that lack of confidence, that sine wave like confidence I have, that it goes up and down. Not great for being a solo business, even though I had some help at that time, you know, starting to get freelancers and contractors. It was still... I thought I was going to fail any moment and that um, that, that mindset of, um, you know, it, it's going to be all taken away and I can't do this. It, it just meant that that's when when Brian said, hey, you know, we need some help. I was like, yeah, OK. <laughs> and, you know, I, I got 
I got an idea that I might be approached because I was invited to their office, get, their company get together in South by Southwest. And I was like, this is the environment I want to be in where there's other people to support you. And um, yeah, so I, I would have preferred, I think, in a way to have kept my hand in, you know, being um, not full time, but it has been great having people around me. And it's because I, I don't feel like I can do the selling. I can do everything else. I, you know, uh, I mean, I worked in marketing and advertising for a while, so I think that's that was my entrepreneurship um, training. But uh, I, I, there's something about selling personally, something that you created that is exciting and cool, and it's great, the rewards, but it's also terrifying for people whose personality don't naturally go to that. That's right. And I think, um, you know, I think some people are just better suited to working in other companies, um, some people are better suited to having their own business. And I think for others, it's kind of a bit of both. Um, and I kind of relate to that. And for me, the way I get around it is to bring other people onto my team to do the selling. Um, and I chime in, but it's it's them who is doing that selling. Um, and for other people, the way they deal with it is to go and work for someone else uh, um, in a team environment where they can just do their part. So, yeah, I think there's different ways through that. What would you say are the biggest three changes in blogging uh, since we wrote the book? I think since we wrote the book, I think um, the dominance of Facebook is huge. But I didn't realize the culture change it would make. I mean, when we were writing the different editions of the book, we could see changes like Dig was the king and then all of a sudden it was nothing. Um, But the fact that people don't share links as much I didn't expect, you know, the focus people would absolutely move their blog from their own space that they owned to these other spaces like Medium and Facebook and YouTube. That surprised me because the idea of a home base is still crucial. Having an email list is still crucial. But so many people have this emphasis on social media, which means people aren't sharing links, which means that the comments moved away. But one of the other biggest is um, the technology is so much more accessible now. And I think it's easier to start technologically. It's easier to start if you have the right community mindset that we talked about earlier. It's that's still a thing. Um, but it, I can see the resistance people have because they think, well, why would somebody listen to me when there's all these other people out there? Mm, yeah, I, th- I think it's the the weight of content that's been created is one of the biggest changes and challenges um, that's come about um, and that's it does put off a lot of people and it's probably the number one thing that stops bloggers as well i've I've noticed over the last years people just aren't able to have their voice <laughs> emerge through that that noise um, yeah that's there but there's so many more channels for the voice I mean the perfect examples of podcasting and video and live streaming i mean you can actually get paid to be you on instagram i mean people are managing to do that all the time i mean there's an unfortunate side effect where the people chasing fame to the point where they actually injure themselves or others but that idea of being an influencer and being paid to have a lifestyle if somebody does said that to us back in <laughs> the early 2000s <laughs> It's interesting because we we were very much, um, when we wrote the book, um, and, you know, probably for a good decade there, niches were king. Um, Everyone had to choose a niche. And I still think that's good advice for many bloggers, but we have seen this lifestyle. um, People want to know what your life is like. um, And that's almost a return to personal blogging um, in, in many ways, but it's now happening on Insta. Um, Facebook and and other places as well. And it's 24-7 instead of episodic, which it used to be. It's like, um, I mean, I follow some people on Instagram and they're literally updating their um, stuff hourly. And that seems so invasive to me, but they love it. So Yeah. I wonder whether there will be a swing back to the the niche um, in some of those platforms like it happened in in blogging. whether people are going to get fed up with the <laughs> miniature of life being shown, I'm not sure. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe it, it will, maybe it won't. 
I wonder if there'll be a, a backlash against being so transparent as well, because that privacy thing, it, it it's something we worked out quite early on. And then now we've got an entire generation of um, content creators who are letting it all out. I mean, to the point where people know exactly where they're at, they are at all times. And, you know, I don't know. It, it seems a bit scary to me. <laughs> Creating great content and building your audience. This is Pro Blogger. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, um, if you were to rewrite the Pro Blogger book today, what would you add or change? Um, and maybe some of that's going to come out of what we've just been talking about. But um, the last edition was 2012. It's been five years. What do does anyone who's read the book or is going to read the book? I think a lot of it still stands up today. Um, but what would you change about it? Yeah, I think the core strategy will never change because it's about generosity and attracting people who you can help and reach and you know who are interested in what you can share. But the tactics have changed quite a lot. And, you know, we had a, quite a lot about SEO, but we didn't really go into paid traffic. And um, we certainly didn't go into the full marketing automation funnels. Um, I mean, we had some, I think, about email, but I don't think we went really into the full tactics now that are quite common. Um, I mean, when I launched my ChrisG.com blog, in after performance in went away it was kind of revolutionary to people that i was giving a free ebook away <laughs> and i did it with my feed as well as email and the people were like whoa this is new and now it's kind of expected right so um i think video tactics live streaming and like instagram and all of that definitely would have to be in there but at the same time, we probably wouldn't emphasize things like AdSense maybe. Yeah, I think it would still be there. I, I had a look through it the other day at some of the monetization um, chapters. Um, we did. We had two pages on affiliate marketing. We had one page on selling e-resources, one page on e-books and courses <laughs> and that type of thing. So Yeah, uh, let's have a look at Digital Photography <laughs> School. <laughs> yeah, so since then, Digital Photography School, that is our, they're our number one and two income streams, whereas when I wrote the book, AdSense was still number one. So monetization has shifted and I think we'd also be wanting to include subscription, um, you know, membership type um things um you'd also be wanting to probably do software as a service as a at least a small mention because you know there, there are more and more blogs who are doing that type of thing as well so um yeah we we've had a lot of content on advertising and influence marketing well not we didn't call it influencer marketing but it was um you know how to get advertisers on your blog but a lot of it was more about getting banner ads on your blog whereas yeah. i think today I, I felt like we were a lot more cynical about um, sponsored posts and uh, that side of thing than we would be today yeah sponsored content ambassadorships those type of um that monetization monetization is definitely there's been a big shift in that um yeah so i think monetization has changed a, a fair bit um but at the core of it, like you said, generosity, um, we had, I guess our main four pillars that we call them were, you know, content, great content, promoting your blog, building community and engagement and monetization. They were the four things that we said that you need to do in order to have a profitable blog. And I think that still stacks up. Yeah. As, and especially now, it's got to be great content. It's got to be good enough that people don't feel they've wasted 20 minutes of their life. Uh, and when you look at the clickbait, the rise of clickbait, um, that's pretty much been in the last few years to toxic levels. It shows that good content is still desirable, but it has to fight against the noise of all this other stuff out there. Mm, definitely. So, yeah, I think it's still a decent read. It's still available on Amazon. Um, I think the other day... <laughs> yeah, I, was, I still see it in bookstores. Yeah, yeah, I saw it in the lib library the other day. I think we were ranked 431,000th highest rated book <laughs> on Amazon the other day. So it's still there. And you could probably pick up a second-hand <laughs> copy of it on Amazon as well if you did want to check it out. Um, 
Yeah, so I think a lot of it still, yeah, is, is kind of relevant, but yeah, obviously things have changed. So we had quite a few questions come in in the Facebook group, um, which I thought I'd throw at you um, and me as well. So Neil asked, um, Neil Watson said, I've often struggled with maintaining motivation for blogging right at the time when you know you should as it's close to reaching that critical point. What advice do you have to maintain the faith um, while you wait for your income streams to develop? So I, I'm, I think what Neil's asking there, I'm pre-coffee, um, is you know when you're waiting for things to grow and, and that first year, the first two years even, can be really tough when you see some traction, you see readers starting to come, but no one's buying your products yet or no one's clicking your ads or it's it hasn't hit the tipping point. And for some blogs, that can take a long time to do. Um, any advice there to keep keep the motivation up? I think one of the things that we've always said is it helps if you're passionate about the topic. Now, that's not to say that you have to choose a, a, a topic that is something that you love and you're passionate about. But one of the things that helps your motivation is if you would talk about this stuff anyway. So like Maker Hacks, uh, if you get me on the topic of uh, what that's about – it's hard to shut me up and obviously with blogging we've had a, a great conversation that's just flowed because we love talking about this stuff and we love teaching it but if somebody said there was a lot of money to make in naked mole rat farming I probably wouldn't find the motivation to write about that so much but then on the other side I think I'm a people pleaser so if I if I put a call out for questions and I get some questions back, I feel I have to answer those. And if I'm in a Facebook group and somebody asks a question and nobody else has answered it and I can answer it, I feel compelled to answer it. And then once I've started it, I might as well copy and paste it into a blog, right? So, um, and uh, by that I mean blog post. I post it in my blog. One of my irritations is when people say, I, I wrote a blog. You wrote a whole blog? No, no, it's an article. <laughs> yep. The same. I think for me, keeping the motivation up, it's partly is about choosing the right topic um, and choose a topic not only that you have an interest in, but that you're growing in, like that you're still discovering in. I think that's, um, that's for me, why I, I've stuck at ProBlogger for so long. Um, it was 2004 when I started it. So it's been 13 years of writing about blogging and, and talking about blogging. And, and I think the reason that I'm still able to create content on it is that I'm still learning stuff. There's still new things that I'm discovering. And so that gets me through the lean patches. And even on an established blog like ProBlogger, there's, there's months and months where we we don't have a, a massive amount of profit, so it's not money that's driving me. It's it's um, satisfaction in in other ways. Um, and I think the other part for me is actually map out the change and and be really aware of the change you're trying to bring to other people. And so for me, I'm a people pleaser as well. And so um, my goal in my life is to make the lives of the people around me better. Um, and if I can see that I'm doing something to improve other people's lives, that gives me a lot of personal satisfaction. So yeah. I think... Yeah, I've uh, yeah. got a feedback folder in my Gmail, and it was something that Pace and Kylie once mentioned at South by Southwest, I think, uh, because I was talking about the negativity, and they said, but don't you get people thanking you and praising you? And I was like, well, yeah, but who focuses on them so they said anytime somebody said something nice put it in this folder so you can look through it and it's amazing the difference you do make to people I'm not going to mention any names but over the years there have been a lot of people who have come back to me and said like Chris if you hadn't have said this at this time I don't know you know what would have happened or the advice you gave me then is turned into how many figures now um and you know, occasionally people say, did you hear so-and-so say on this webinar about you? And that keeps me going as well, because it's like, I, I like being behind the curtain, um, Wizard of Oz style, but it's nice for people to, you know, show that what you do makes a difference. So if you can make a difference and people are willing to tell you about that, mm. incredibly motivated. I think the other thing I'd, I'd say to Neil is you look at your stats and you see a number 
um, just remind yourself constantly that the amount of people who've shown up on your blog is not just a number, it's people, it's human beings that have shown up on your blog. And, and to me, that makes a massive difference. If 100 people look at my blog over, over a week, over a month, that's pretty significant that 100 people have taken the time, like human beings have taken the time to read something that you've said. And they may not leave a comment, they may not buy your product, but in some way, that is a valid thing and that's important. You may have just changed yeah. one of their lives in some way as well. I think there's another aspect though as well that you, for the first thousand subscribers, uh, you you don't really see that reward for the effort you put in. And then suddenly the, the dam bursts, I'm going to mix my analogies, but it's like a flywheel. You know, it takes effort to start and then it's got a life of its own. Or cranking the old manual start cars where you'd have to, crank it and crank it manually and then suddenly uh, the combustion engine would take over it's the same with blogs there there seems to be a threshold that you have to pass and so many people give up before they get there it's one of the memes that goes around one of those quotes that somebody put my quote on is uh, that people give up when it gets hard but when it gets hard it's often just before you succeed and there does seem to be like a dam burst moment for many blogs and you can't time ahead of time when it's going to be, but you can feel it after it's happened. Yeah. But yeah. So keep working. <laughs> you can do yeah. it. You can do it. Um, yeah. Compete against your, your yesterday's stats. Don't compete against other people. Don't think they've got 34,000 subscribers. I've only got 10. It's like being at the gym. Compete against you and not Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. And that, I mean, that reminds me of what I used to do. I used to look at my stats from last month and make my goal to be 10% higher next month. Um, and some months I went 20% or 30% higher. Some months I went backwards. But I think if you can keep that trajectory moving forward, um, even 10, 20% a month increase over time, that's an exponential growth. And you do the, you extend that out for a year or two and you'll be amazed at where you could be if you keep that kind of small step-by-step -step growth up. Um, yeah, so little goals can, can really help you get there. Um, another question that came in from Emily. Um, she says, I'm having the same problem at the moment. Good subscriber base, highly engaged audience who are ready and waiting for products to buy. And I'm struggling with the overwhelming task of not only continuing to blog regularly and increase my traffic, but also to put the products, um, the books and ebooks um, together. Um, so, the, and I see this tension a lot, you know, bloggers who know they need to keep content coming, but they also want to create something to sell. And to create something to sell is going to take them away from the blogging, which could then decrease their audience, which means they won't have anyone to sell it to. So how do you get that balance right? And you've you've gone through this. You've created products. Um, I see you're doing something at the moment on um, on your current blog of putting a product together. Is it an ebook or a course that you're putting together there? Yeah, it's a, a workshop that, you know, eventually it's going to be three prices, the typical strategy of, small, medium, and large, with the small being just the ebook. And uh, the way I did that uh, is to use the fact that I'm a people pleaser and uh, the accountability of that. I pre-launched it and said, anybody that buys, pay what you want. Anybody that buys will get the full thing and gets to give feedback to me, steer the ship. So you almost get a bespoke product. You get the cheapest price it'll ever be, but in reward in return for your feedback right so and there was no product they paid for it told me that this was a, a thing that had legs and so i had to then produce the product i had to write thousands of words all of a sudden and i had a deadline self-imposed but had all these people who had paid money who would then do a chargeback or a refund uh, i'm using gumroad because it's got a pay what you want feature mm. So I had to deliver. <laughs> yeah, so in, in many ways you did a, your own little Kickstarter. Yeah. I guess there. Um, so that's... The, it tests the market as well yeah. because if nobody put a dollar in, I knew I'd have known that nobody was willing to because people tell you they want to buy a product, but until they actually get their hand in the wallet, they can change their mind. And people buy with their mind, their brain, before they buy with their credit card. Um, so you can't just say, hey, I've got a product now. 
because that's not going to sell as well as, you know, you have to do some sort of pre-launch. So it's good to involve people early on. I think I'm going to do this. I've about 80% decided what it's going to be, but tell me what you think. And then you say, okay, I've done an early beta version of it. What do you think? You know, you're going to get it for a low price and then incrementally improve it, which means it doesn't have to be complete at the time you sell it. It, It's a, a promise to improve, but then you don't have to have created this whole thing in the hope that somebody would buy it. The worst thing you can do is create something, spend six months of your life on it, and then find nobody wants to buy no it. No one wants it. Yeah. Another thing that I've seen some bloggers do is um, with an ebook is release the first two or three chapters for sale first at a you know massively reduced price. So, and that is partly to get it done. Um, and you know, not have to be overwhelmed by a massive project, um, but also partly it's a proof of concept. If anyone buys those first few chapters, there's a, a good chance that they'll want the rest as well. So uh, there are different ways to do that. I guess the other alternative is to write your ebook on your blog, which is what I did for my first two. Um, gave ninety percent of it away on the blog, but people then purchased um, the ebook because they wanted the extra stuff that I put in, but they also wanted it in a nice package, a logically um, easy to read package, um, rather than having to go through all the different blog posts that were already on the blog. So it may be another way to go about it too. How to build and monetize your blog. This is Pro Blogger. Um, Belinda asks, um, I would love to hear your predictions for online video classes and venue options for posting them. So Kajabi, Teachable, Skillshare, Udemy. Um, do you have any thoughts on that um, in, in terms of, um, I guess it's courses, um, yeah. video content? I've uh, got a huge bias against having my stuff on somebody else's domain. Um now, it's a little bit hypocritical because I actually teach for the local university and all of my stuff is on their domain and I don't even own it. That said, <laughs> when I do stuff outside of that, um, I, I don't like having my name dot Kajabi or whatever. Um, just because it's that digital sharecropping thing, they can take it away from you. I also don't like the ones where there seems to be a sale every month to get something that was worth $90 for $15 or where you only get a share of people you sign up to the whole thing, whereas they give most of it away. So you're getting crumbs of crumbs. My preference is to use these other venues to generate leads. So I'm considering creating an Amazon Kindle book not because I think it will make money, but because I think it's a place that people search for things of this nature and that will generate leads for me and my courses that will be on my home base. Uh, So like YouTube, I use that for lead generation. I don't use it as my entire um, channel. It's a place people search so uh, they can find me there and then I lead them back home. And that's what I try to do with everything. So uh, These venues, I think, are great as a way of getting awareness to a place that you wouldn't otherwise. Like iTunes is obviously great to get awareness through podcasting, but don't have your podcast as your entire online presence because they could easily take that away. If you have a balked feed, then you've lost your audience. You haven't got an email list backed up. You know, it's, it's gone. I have a podcast now that's vanished from iTunes and I need to work out why the the mainframe that I did with uh, Tony Clark and we had you know months worth of content on there and you can't find it now on iTunes. Fortunately I've got other things for people to find me with. So that's how I would look at it. I I would have the content on your home base and you, I would charge people to have access to that. Um, because the biggest assets that you've got are your your list of leads and your list of customers, with the second being the most valuable. Mm. And that's that's certainly what we've tried to do on Digital Photography School. We've actually hacked together our own way of delivering courses there, so we don't use any uh, real plug in there. Um, there are certainly since we've <laughs> done that, there are other products now that do it uh, in a way that you can all host on your own on your own site. We've stayed clear of Udemy and Skillshare and those type of um, places. I think 
you know, they can be a great way um, if you don't have any presence at all. That would be the other argument, I guess, for those type of um, places to host your products. If you've got absolutely no traffic and you want um, to put something out quickly, that may be an option. But ultimately, I'd be trying to get as many people over onto your own home base as well. Yeah, I think w one of the things that people think will be a benefit is that exposure. But there's definitely a 80-20 rule or even a 90-10 rule that 10% have all the exposure. It's like with Kickstarter. We hear about the ones that make a million dollars. But most Kickstarters, it's people with an existing audience who actually get a successful Kickstarter. Exactly. So. And if you go over and look on Udemy, you, you do find that um, – in, in many of the categories, the, yeah, the, the biggest seller courses are ones where they've driven a lot of traffic from their own platforms already, which, um, yeah, it, it, it looks tempting, but it doesn't always work out. Another question from Ash Roy. I think you were on Ash's podcast. He says in episode yeah, six welcome. of his podcast, <laughs> um, so early days for you, um, he said that you said something that he has quoted in almost every episode since. Uh, you said something to the effect of content marketing is a conversation that's happening out there right now between a buyer and a seller. The only question is, do you, as a seller marketer, want to be part of that conversation? And he asked if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, well, I didn't invent that concept because um, I'm going to show my age now with a clue train manifesto. Yes. Uh, <laughs> So some people will have heard of that. Other people will be like, well, um, so the clue, clue train manifesto was um, a book which was available for free and you could buy about the market being conversations and about how there is this discussion going on, whether you're part of it or not, and whether you interrupt it or if you're like welcomed into this conversation, there's a different conversation in itself, but you have to be out there and creating content and answering the questions people have because they're going to have them questions and they're going to get answers so you might as well be the one that gives them the answer and there used to be this entire culture of keeping secrets where the salesperson was the gatekeeper and um, that come to mind very strongly because my daughter's of the age now she needs a car and we've been looking at car dealerships and still even though there's so much online they'll not talk to you at the dealership without uh, putting you in front of a salesperson who's going to give you the hard sell and the, you know all the upsells and the sales pitch and it's like do they realize that they're competing against this low pressure low salesy uh, thing where all the information is already there we just don't know from you so be helpful and we will reward you and um you know content marketing is all about that it, back when we started there wasn't content marketing there wasn't really a uh, blog culture but giving the information away and being rewarded for it uh, you know has always existed and i think that's what we are becoming a culture of where we look to the internet almost before we look to each other <laughs> uh, I mean how many times have you seen or done it yourself you'll go onto Twitter and ask a question you'll go to Facebook and ask a question and it starts a conversation and it's it gives you the answer hopefully but also you could Google and research but we have a conversation instead you know it's it's almost like that's the glue that holds people together now online versus going to yellow pages or, you know. So I think the gatekeepers are going away and the conversation's moved online and you're either part of it or you're not going to sell anymore. Yeah, it's so true. And it, it, I found it fascinating when you told your story before about 1996 and answering questions and writing articles if you were asked the que same question twice. And I'm like, you did content marketing <laughs> back in 1996. Yeah. It was That's Without exactly realizing. what it was. There was no... There was no name um yeah. but you invented it chris <laughs> <laughs> if i had my time again i wouldn't have used my name probably but yeah uh, and the thing is that uh, i think by not selling myself i almost increased my authority with the people who wanted to buy because at no point was there a call to action <laughs> at no point was i saying 
uh, even like um, this where you can find me to to buy services. It was more if you've got questions, this is how to contact me. And you know that, like you said, when uh, Wiley contacted you, the first time somebody asked me if I could coach them or teach them, I thought it was a, a friend. I thought they were going to break out laughing after a minute of conversation. And, you know, it took a few of those to realize that this was a thing rather than a fluke. But I just carried on doing what I was doing. I did, in in the end, set up a page. But at the time, it was just, you know, there wasn't just me writing articles. A lot of people did. But, you know, to be asked to write articles for print magazines because of something found online that was really weird because I never thought of myself as a writer. I was just a nerd who happened to write. Mm. So you started Maker Hacks. When was that that it kicked off? <laughs> uh, I bought the domain and we actually did a webinar, you and I, about um, how to start a, in a new niche and how ah, to research. For yes. It. And I did all the research and then um, I had that imposter syndrome kick in and I got busy and I made excuses. And then one day I was talking to my friend Ben, who he works for in the uh, special effects industry. And um, we had a really nice conversation just geeking out about this stuff. And I was like, yeah, I think I think I actually am going to write about this because I love it. And if people insult me, so what? Uh, and so uh, like February last year, I, I started it properly. And um, my friend Rafael, who is also a colleague, helped tweak the design and we used the Rainmaker platform and yeah, it's been great. It's, it's even though I, I sparsely create content for it, it's done really well. And it's <laughs> the four pillars have all come back uh, and come into to play. Definitely. So what did you do in launching that, that blog that you haven't done in the past or you wouldn't have done in, in a previous blog? Uh, I did exactly what I did in a previous blog. Uh, everybody would be shocked to hear I was in Facebook groups and I was answering questions and any question that came up a lot, I would write about it. That, so surprising. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's a lot of groups that if you're helpful, they will allow you to drop a link. Now, I'm not saying spam Facebook groups, please. Uh, and it's not my biggest traffic um, source at all. But as a way of getting insight into what people are being challenged with and the questions they have, you can't beat social media. It's a complaint delivery system. So you go into Twitter and you go to Facebook and people say, why does this not work? How do I do this? And then you write an article about it. It's awesome. But yeah, search traffic is by far my biggest uh, source of traffic. Um, And you've only been going uh, since February, wasn't it? I I think... February last year, so it's not it's not an old blog. And I noticed you posted a picture in the Facebook group yesterday or the day before about how search engine optimization isn't dead um, because even a relatively new blog, you were getting decent SEO traffic. Yeah, uh, and Google's been very kind to me, but how did I get those links? I guess posted. I actually got paid to write a couple, which is even better because it's guest posting but <laughs> with compensation. Uh, and so uh, if I look as we speak, uh, I've had 14,728 Google visits um, this month in the last 30 days. And, you know, that's just doing the stuff that we wrote about in the pro blogger book. It, it's not much different. You know, you write good content, you, you you tweak it a little bit so that search engines will know what you're writing about. And then you get links to it. And that's same we always talk but i think you know you you do need the other pillars it's not just promotion um it's the combination it's the you know the sum of the parts combined give a bigger whole yeah so one of the things i noticed you're doing quite a bit is not only engaging in other people's facebook groups but you seem to have your own for maker hacks as well how important has that been uh, i guess that taps into that community engagement part uh, pillar that we often talk about yeah and um one of the things i think that has been important about it is that group is almost a refuge from some of the other groups for people um because i have a zero tolerance for trolls 
and people get beaten up online a lot. And um, especially people who uh, may be a bit timid or English isn't the first language, um, they get chewed up a little bit. So one of the things that I like to do is just make sure that there are ground rules and everybody sticks to them and everybody's nice. But one of the other parts of it is um, there's some authority by gathering a community around you, even though I'm not the most knowledgeable of this topic. I mean, you know, I'm in the same space as uh, Adam Savage from Mythbusters. You know, I'm not going to be the expert, but I can be somebody who is uh, known to be generous and kind and, you know, uh, approachable in the community and having my own space to invite people to is part of that. You're listening to Pro Blogger. Do you feel any danger in investing into someone else's space? Because, you know, we've talked a number of times today about building your own home base. Yeah, 100% there's the danger because, um, well, there's there's two dangers. One, all of my comments have moved to Facebook <laughs> because I've turned them off. So Facebook owns my discussions now. Uh, so that's both great and uh, awful in equal measure. But, you know, we talked about trolls earlier. One of the things they will do is brigade and all get together to mark something as spam or as illegal or offensive things get taken down on YouTube, you know, channels get taken down, Facebook groups get taken out. Um, the unfortunate side to my brand is hacks. And it's uh, the, the word hack for some people means hacking. And that means illegal activity to them. So I keep attracting people who don't know what we're talking about. And so come say, have you got a hack to break into Android? Or do you have a, a crack for Windows 10? Uh, so I've got some questions now that people have to answer before they can join. The amount of people say, no, I will not follow the rules, but they answer the other questions correctly. It's like, you really think I'm going to allow you in when you say you're not going to follow the rules. <laughs> but uh, another danger, which you might not really think of as it's a first world problem, if you like. I've got over 6,000 members of that group, but my email list is lagging behind. I haven't even got a thousand email subscribers, which, you know, for an 18 month old or under site, that isn't terrible. But I'm used to growing my email list a lot faster than that, especially with the stuff I'm giving away. So the danger is that people find the stuff already and don't feel the need to sign up. And so, you know, am I hurting the long term? I don't know. Mm. It's interesting, in episode 196 of this podcast, we interviewed Nikki Parkinson and she talked about how she only allows people to join their Facebook group if they sign up for her email address, uh, email list first. So the Ooh. way you get an invitation is to sign up a form, you give your email address, and then she sends you a link to the group. Uh, and That's interesting. She said she's grown her email list um much faster that way um, as a result of that. Um, well, I don't know that my group is growing partly because Facebook keeps recommending it to people because they tell me. Uh, so I, I think my strategy right now is to get people from the group to my email, and I think I just have to show them a, a better reasons. argument for yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, maybe some exclusive content there. Or, or... Well, there is exclusive content, but it's not something that appeals to everybody. And that, mm. One of the things about my niche is it's not very niche because it's such a broad thing it's um it's making <laughs> and yep. so i've got woodworkers all the way through to robot builders <laughs> yeah. you need a couple of groups <laughs> yeah um so one more question on maker hacks um i you mentioned it before but you've got your work um workbook or workshop or, or something that you're building there that product um and you've got your name your own price at the moment with the beta and that made me uh, a little bit curious is it working yeah are, are people actually paying um they are yeah uh, I mean, I've, the the lowest you can pay is a dollar. Yeah. So, um, and the, we we know there's a huge gulf between zero and a dollar. We talked about it earlier. People say they want a thing, and then you know it works out that actually they really didn't want the thing. They wanted it for free. Um, the the nice thing about 
doing pay what you want is people will actually tell you what it's worth to them. And there are some s- sneaky psychological tricks so you can frame it so people will pay more. I haven't done any of those. But still, people on average are paying about $10, $15, with the highest being about 25 and the lowest being um, a dollar. But a whole bunch of people are at the $5 level, a whole bunch of people at the $10 level. So that says to me that I've got something of some value. Not necessarily like it's not going to make me wealthy, but I don't need it to. I've got a full time job. So that's that's nice. I mean, the idea about behind monetizing it is partly as a little petri dish. <laughs> it's like a science project. Um, and part of it is to like feed my habit <laughs> with all the stuff that I've been spending money on. I do get review items now, really expensive ones. It's cool. Um, but, you know, I started this by buying my own stuff and most of it is me buying my own stuff so it it funds itself but yeah the crazy thing is um people are seeing value in it before they get to actually see it because there's no demo video or like behind the scenes all of there is is a sales page and it's telling people somehow that it's worth between a dollar and 25 dollars so yeah that's great that's great do you think you would consider when you have the final product um, allowing people to continue to do that or did, will you go with a... Um... I wasn't going to. I was going to do that small, medium, large thing, mm-hmm. which is the marketer thing to do. But there's a part of me that says I don't actually need the money and it's nice to make it so accessible to people because, you know, it's like if you can't afford a dollar, then you can't afford this as a hobby because even the um, the cheapest circuit board that people use, the little computers... Even on eBay, they're a couple of dollars. So, um, but it's nice to make it accessible, especially to kids. I've been giving a lot of school teachers free access. Uh, and if you're a school teacher that's listening and you've got a STEM, uh, feel free to just email me with your your school email address because, you know, I, I want to. Inc- My mission, and it sounds cheesy, is to inspire a million makers. That's great. <laughs> so. It's, that, it's out there now. <laughs> we do the um, same on uh, DPS. We um, often allow schools to um, reprint our stuff and we wouldn't allow that in other circumstances, but schools, I think, is uh, it's a great way to... Well, it builds your brand as well and, and that's not why we do it, but it certainly ha- has a flow and impact as well. Yeah, as I said, I, I don't actually... You know, while ever Brian's not firing me, I don't need this, the income from it. So um, I, I just... I like the fact that um, it's helping people get into making things. And um, part of it is I think we have a disposable culture and we have a almost we're moving away from the inquis- inquisitiveness of how does this work to just assuming it will work. There's a lot of black boxes. So I, I want to encourage people, especially young people, to take things apart, put them back together again and make new things. So anytime I can get a teacher on board, I think that's a great thing. That's very cool. So you mentioned Brian again there. It might be a good time just to talk a little bit about Rainmaker Digital. Um, you mentioned your role as the chief digital officer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> Uh, well, a few people have joked it should be OCD uh, but instead of CDO, but it, it's a combination of marketing and technology. And um, as you know, marketing technology is a thing that over the last 10 years has exploded. There's like so many tools, so many ways to automate things. And uh, so... It, the, the marketing role has expanded to have a lot of technology involved. So a lot of organizations now, either they have an IT person and a marketing person and together they try to liaise or they have somebody who has an aspect of both. And that's happened to me. Me, I spent a good couple of years um, heading up development of the Rainmaker platform, but that's moved to a new organization now. There's a whole new company um, that's running with Rainmaker as a platform. And so now I'm in charge of marketing technology for what's left and the marketing strategy of uh, Studio Press and Copy Blogger, which is awesome because I go back to being a teacher and doing DIY because, you know, Rainmaker platform, a lot of it was there and done for you, uh, which is why it was a premium so- software as a service. 
with studio press sites it's wordpress hosting it's like wordpress hosting on steroids but you build your own site you know you add your own plugins and themes or you can use what's included it, it's complete flexibility which means you know it costs less as well and we've got the studio press themes and we've got the education it's awesome can you tell us a little bit about you know studio press and um what it's becoming um because i th- we do get a lot of questions from our our facebook group about you know where should i host my site how do i get seo right which plugins should i in- install and i think you've you've developed a solution here that is going to be attractive to a lot of bloggers yeah i mean with that full transparency we talked about earlier i'm not a salesperson so this isn't going to be for everybody uh, it's 27 dollars a month so that is out of the budget for people who uh may be having a personal website to keep their family up to date right you know you have to be making some money to be able to but at the same time it's a fully managed and built for purpose hosting platform for WordPress and especially the Genesis framework. So it's award-winning how fast it is. It's rock solid. Uh, it takes all the sort of the worry away. You're not going to get hacked. Um, everything in the WordPress core is kept up to date for you. you know, the Genesis framework and your theme is kept up to date. So it allows you to focus on what you created a website for, which was creating content and serving your customers without worrying about, is my website running? Is anybody hacking me? Is the malware on it? You know, is it working for search engines? You know, because uh, that is one of the things we talked about earlier. SEO is still a thing. It's search engines are still sending the majority of the traffic. And if you don't tap into that, you're doing yourself a disservice. So we looked at what the pain was in hosting because we did synthesis before. It's not like we're new to hosting. And we realized that the WordPress community needs something where you could get up and running very quickly. You needed the flexibility, but also you needed that protection. And so we've got something that's super fast, flexible, and takes that pain away but gives you the reassurance that it's going to be there and it's going to be working. But one of the things we also found, and I don't know if you remember this time because you've been having heavy duty hosting for quite a while, but that thing of being punished for success, you know, you get that big link that day where you get a spike of traffic, say from a social site or dig or Reddit or a big blogger and it takes your site down. You you know, you're being punished for your success that doesn't happen with this because you know don't worry about bandwidth and don't worry about how many visitors you get we'll worry about that you worry about creating your content looking after your customers and ultimately for me that's that's who this is perfect for it's for those who want to just write and and maybe promote and, and build engagement but they don't really have the skills or ability or experience to host uh, keep things secure, keep plugins up to date, all that that back end. So yes, there's a cost, but that's what the cost goes towards. And um, you know, for a large percentage of our audience, I know that's an attractive thing. So um, definitely wanted to mention it in this podcast. Um, we are, are an affiliate for it, so we um, I'll disclose that, and you can find all the links um, for that. But you could also Google it and skip our affiliate link if, if you're offended by that as well. Yeah. Um, but I like to think as well that um, if if anybody felt like they, they tried it and they didn't quite find it, it was everything we talked about, you know Studio Press, you know us, uh, you you get a refund. You know, it's not like there's no hard sell at, at any point in time. So there's a lot of people who um, are out there that are like making tens of thousands of dollars as a hosting affiliate. And they don't actually have any knowledge or experience of what they're promoting. They're just promoting the one with the biggest affiliate payout. Um, so I, I would just say you know if if it sounds like something that would be helpful to you try it out and if you don't like it you you don't have to keep it yeah (laughs) and i mean you pointed out earlier that amazing little graph and um of how many people are on the genesis framework these days i think it's 16 percent of all wordpress theme usage is now with genesis so it's not an untested theme um, or platform uh this is something that is the most common 
um, tool out there. Anyway, this is not a sales um, podcast. I just <laughs> no. really wanted to mention it because it's it's something that we've used over the years. Our our yeah. sites are hosted on Synthesis, which uh, same servers, um, and and so it's something we genuinely believe in. Yeah. We've covered so much ground today. Um, I thank you. We only got through half of the questions that were submitted, so we may have to do this again at some point. Maybe um, we'll we'll focus in on a a particular theme next time. Um, But thanks so much uh, for joining us today, Chris. Appreciate uh, your time. Always a pleasure. I'm going to have to uh, book another flight down to Australia. We need to catch up in person again. I think we do. Um, And maybe it it could be at um, our Dallas event or something like that uh, later in the year as well. Um, And thank you so much for participating in the Facebook group. I uh, have appreciated uh, your answers. I know you have that uh, need to answer questions, so um, I'll take advantage of that <laughs> as long yeah, as you want to keep I, answering. I do nerd explain. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's totally fine. I know many of our uh, group members are appreciating you there. So um, before we go, you can find Chris in the Facebook group if you, if you want to touch base with him there, but uh, where else can uh, our listeners find you? Um. The Facebook group's probably the best place right now because it's you can guarantee I'm going to be there every day. But um, makerhacks.com and chrisg.com are my websites. And obviously, um, you might see me on Studio Press or Copy Blogger. I'm behind the scenes more and more, but uh, you know we do webinars and stuff. That's right. All right, thanks so much, Chris. Appreciate it. Thank you. This is Pro Blogger. Wow, I just listened, uh, re-listened to that uh, conversation and we did cover a lot of ground. As I mentioned at the top of the show, our show notes are at problogger.com forward slash podcast forward slash 202 where you can get a full transcript as well as all the links mentioned. Over on the show notes, I do link to Chris's blog. You can also find that at makerhacks.com and also I link on the show notes today with our affiliate link to Studio Press if you'd like to give a little bit back to Problogger um, and you are looking for a solution to uh, host your blog and um, uh, keep it secure and uh, rank well in SEO, Studio Press is a great option and uh, we would appreciate if you would pick that up through our affiliate link on the show notes. And lastly, there's a link there to our book, which I just looked on Amazon and it's $3 at the moment if you buy a used copy of it. Uh, I think it's 16 bucks if you pick up a Kindle copy as well. So uh, it's still available and as I say during the show, I think it's still pretty relevant uh, in the main and with some of what you heard today. Hopefully, you've got the full story. Anyway, thanks for listening today. I do hope to uh, connect with you next week in episode 203. And if you're in Australia, I'd love to see you at our Aussie events as well. Um, We do have a few tickets left for the Mastermind in Brisbane. Uh, the end of July and uh, there are tickets for day one of the Brisbane event as well uh, and in Melbourne in the first week of August as well. So if you are in Australia, you can get to Brisbane or Melbourne uh, check out problogger.com forward slash events and you'll see all the details of how you can get to that event with a last minute ticket. Thanks for listening today. Chat with you next week. You've been listening to Pro Blogger. If you'd like to comment on any of today's topics or subscribe to the series, find us at problogger.com forward slash podcast. Tweet us at problogger. Find us at facebook.com forward slash problogger or search problogger on iTunes. Before I go, I want to give a big shout out and say thank you to Craig Hewitt and the team at Podcast Motor who've been editing all of our podcasts for some time now. Podcast Motor have a great range of services for podcasters at all levels. They can help you to set up your podcast, but also offer a couple of excellent services to help you to edit your shows and get them up with great show notes. Check them out at podcastmotor.com.